Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Epiphany Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text is the Gospel reading that we just heard from Matthew's second chapter. And if you're going to ask Matthew to bring you to Jesus, as we've just done, then you better be prepared not just to observe the Christ or to learn something from him, but to worship him. Chronologically speaking, the first to meet the Christ child are the shepherds, and it is Luke who records their story. Luke tells us that the shepherds found the baby just as the angels had said, and then they ran and they told everyone else what had happened. And we never read that they worshiped him. Chronologically speaking, the next to meet Jesus are the Magi from the East. Matthew records their story. And from the beginning to the end of it, it's all about worshiping the Christ. Where is he who is born King of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. It is interesting that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the account of the leper who came to Jesus saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. But of the three of them, only Matthew tells us that the man knelt before him when he made his request. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the episode of the ruler who came to Jesus imploring his help for his dying daughter. But it's only Matthew who tells us that the ruler knelt before Jesus when he made his request. Matthew, Mark, and John each record the accounts of Jesus walking on the stormy sea. But only Matthew tells us that after the sea grew calm and Jesus was in the boat with them all, they all worshipped him. Same holds true for the accounts of the Canaanite woman and her pleas for her daughter, the mother of the sons of Zebedee who pleads for her two sons, and the account of the resurrection. It is only in Matthew's gospel that we read that they worshiped Jesus. The point is, if we're gonna ask Matthew to lead us to Jesus this evening, we better be prepared to worship the Christ. That's what he is leading us and leads us to do. The celebration of the day of Epiphany centers upon the account of the visitation of the Magi who come from the east in search of the king of the Jews. These wise men, maybe not were so wise, they were certainly not kings, and there may have been more or less than three of them that there were three, according to our tradition and our hymns, is merely based on the number of gifts that show up. And frankly, whether there's three or 33, doesn't much matter to what the theme of the reading is all about. I would say three is just fine, let's stick with it. Otherwise, you've got to start subtracting or adding little figurines to all of those Activity sets that you own in your home. Matthew writes, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? Again, whether it was three or thirty-three, the important point here is that some men were looking for Jesus. Actually, that's not so strange at all. It happens all the time. No other figure in human history has ever attracted more interest than Jesus Christ. Men and women, boys and girls, of whatever background, whatever religion, and whatever level in society would like to find him for a whole list of reasons some to learn from him, some to argue with him, some to disprove him, some to be healed by him, and some to crucify him. Matthew tells us 
that the Magi's motive for wanting to find Jesus was so they might worship him. Where is he who is born King of the Jews? For we saw his star when it arose, and we have come to worship him. The word that Matthew uses for worship is the Greek word proskuneo. From proskuneo comes our English word to prostrate. Literally, it means to get down on your knees, to kneel, or even to fall on your face to prostrate yourself before an authority figure is a symbolic act of submission to him. Proskuneo is not really a biblical word. In most places, whenever anyone, a citizen or a foreigner, came before a king of a land, either their own or a foreign king, they were expected to kneel before that authority figure. It was a sign that they were submitting to his authority over them. They were worshiping him. Everyone worships. God created man to be a worshiping creature. It's one of the things that distinguish human beings from the animals and the rocks and the trees and the stars in the sky. God made man with a knee that bends, and it bends most specially to him. Of course, not if your knee is bent, right? Okay, I'll revise that. God made man with a knee to bend. Sometimes they don't bend well. But he made man with a knee to bend to him, to bow down to him, and to submit to his authority over them. But after the fall into sin, things changed. Not everything. Man did not lose his God-given nature to worship. But sin corrupted that nature so that now man worships what is not God. In the beginning, God gave man dominion over the created things and called that good. But we have turned that around so that now we bend the knee we prostrate ourselves to created things. We worship them. And that is not good. In fact, that is sin. And the fact that we worship what we should not worship is really only half of the problem. The other half being that we refuse to bend the knee to submit to, to worship the one true God who made us in his own image. Everyone worships. The million dollar question is, what do we worship? Luther was exactly right when he said that we worship what we fear, love, and trust above all things. The million dollar question then is, what is that? What do we bend the knee to because we are afraid of what will happen to us if we don't submit to it? That is, that we fear above all fears. What do we worship because it is precious to us and we love it? That is, we love it above all other loves. What do we submit to because we trust what it promises to do for us? That is, we trust it above all other trusts. What do we fear, love, and trust above all things? That is what we worship. Is it the almighty dollar? Is it the standard of living that you enjoy? Is it a reputation among others, your peers, your classmates? It is, is it a ruler, a politician, an athlete? Is it you? Is it the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? We dare not be fooled by body language. The bending of the knees and the bowing of the head do not always communicate what is really going on in the heart. The outward act that is called worship may fool some men and women, but God sees the heart. Jesus declares, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
King Herod sent the Magi to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I too may come and worship him. But really what he meant was that I too may murder him. Unlike Herod, we worship him when we allow him to rule over us. Not as we think that he should rule over us, telling him what laws and regulations we are willing to submit to and what rights and privileges we demand in return. But when we believe that he is good and gracious and full of mercy and abounding in steadfast love, irregardless of the circumstances of our life, especially when we suffer. The Magi came from far away to find the King of the Jews so that they might worship him. They looked for him in the capital city at the royal palace, no doubt seated upon the royal throne because after all, where else would you expect to find a king? It just goes to show that if in your search for the king you follow the stars, that's about as close to him as you're gonna get. It took the inspired, infallible scriptures to point them to what they were seeking. The prophet Micah had written, O you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. And so off to Bethlehem they go, and there they find what they were seeking, the king of the Jews, in a little village, in a borrowed home, a small child, totally dependent, no kingdom, no authority, at least none that they could see like they could see that star in the sky. Who would have known? Who would have known that this little infant lying in the manger was himself, himself, worshiping the Father in pure and holy worship? He came down from the throne that was rightfully his because he bent his knee to his Father. He humbled himself and made himself nothing taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, becoming obedient to his father, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. That is worship. Certainly no star in the sky could ever have told us this. Who could have known that that man hanging from a cross was the one that the Magi were searching for, the King of the Jews, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, except the scripture told us so. And over his head they put the charge against him which read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Who could have known that hanging from the cross, Jesus is worshiping the Father, bending his knee, his face to the ground, perfectly, completely submitting to the authority of his Father, and all because, and all because, we do not. His perfect obedience to the Father is the only pure and holy act of worship there has ever been. The outward actions of his worship are in perfect harmony with the worship of his heart. And his perfect worship is for you. It is the perfect and complete substitute for all of our sinful and hypocritical worship. He presents the precious gifts of his body and his blood to the Father on our behalf. And the Father receives these gifts and proclaims, with him I am well pleased. And then he turns around and he offers the same precious gifts to us. And when we receive them, we make his worship our own. And the Father is well pleased with us too for the sake of his obedient son. At the beginning of his gospel, St. Matthew tells us that the Magi from far away came to worship the King of the Jews. At the end of his gospel, the scene is of 11 men gathered around Jesus, who was crucified but now is raised from the dead. And Matthew writes, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. 
All authority has been given to me, he says. And he sends them out as his own magi to make disciples of all nations, to every corner of the globe, every little village, every tribe, every nation, an uncountable multitude, each one, one at a time, given the invitation, come, let us worship him. St. Paul takes Jesus' great commission to its ultimate and inevitable conclusion. Writing to the Philippians, Paul sees the day when at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, the whole creation worshiping Jesus. Jesus tells the Samaritan woman at the well, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. That hour has come to us tonight, and it is now. Come, let us worship the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm.